All right, here we are. So, uh, uh, Jason, it's a pleasure to connect with you. It's really curious that I first came across your work as a as a writer, as you know, as a, you're a film, you're a lover of film, and obviously you've, you've done a lot of writing on the subject of films. The Blood Poets series I was familiar with as a kid because my my dad is mentioned in it, and some of his work is discussed. So I I'd seen it on his bookshelf. And then um, obviously we connected more recently when you reached out about your new book, Kubrickon, uh, which takes a, a much more critical approach to Stanley Kubrick and his work um, yeah. and necessarily. So I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an important perspective, but you know, I haven't read all of your work, but I'm fascinated because you, you are both, you know, like myself, you're a lover of movies. You're fascinated by the psycho spiritual landscape of cinema. And you've also done work on, you know, the Vice of Kings, for example, which deals with uh, socialism and occultism and pedophilia and things like this. And you've written a book on, the, you know, called Matrix Warrior. So I think, you know, you're just a fascinating person to talk with. And I really want to uh, understand essentially like your your worldview in a sense. So maybe the best place to begin is with your Vice of Kings book. Um, because again, it's the subtitle is socialism occult, how socialism occultism and the sexual revolution engineered a culture of abuse. Um, it, this is obviously a major issue in, in my work, my series best kept secret talks about the, the pedophilia, the, the ritual abuse, this trafficking, the, uh, many of these factors when it comes to the rearing of children. And it's not just the perverts in power, but it's also a cultural psychology of abusing children. So I'm really curious to know the vice of kings as far as what really inspired your journey down this down that particular rabbit hole well yeah because that the vice of kings really does get to the root of that question like what inspired me uh, even though it was a later book um uh insofar as it's it has a big picture, a wider focus on the whole of British society and British politics, specifically it's Fabian socialism, but the publishers, they didn't want Fabian in the subtitle because they thought it was too marginal, which I think is unfortunate because it, it really is specifically about the Fabian kind of socialism. Um, and uh, so I had been interested, even when I was first writing books about film, uh, I was interested in, I think you call it the psychosocial or psychosexual landscape, but the hidden, the hidden landscape, what I call organized malevolence in society. Uh, even when I was interested in film, specifically in writing about film, I was aware of this hidden dimension to film and to society, and, uh, and even of organized ritual abuse of children from quite a young age. Well, the point is actually from a very young age, I was aware of it, but mentally, I became aware of it in my 20s. And uh, so there were these two parallel lines that I was exploring or realms or worlds as a writer was film and uh, what I term paranoid awareness, but the conspiratorial aspects of society and culture. And um, when, the way that Vice of Kings came about was that I became aware through a series of, well, one specific incident, which was the death of my brother, Sebastian Horsley, who was a minor celebrity when he died, um, combined with looking into Jimmy Savile, who the American listeners may or may not be familiar with. I imagine through your, I imagine you've talked about Jimmy Savile because such a huge, uh, is this an iceberg, really, a tip of an iceberg that you can't ignore if you want to look into these things? So after he died in 2012, I started to look into Jimmy Savile. It's actually my wife who kept pushing me to, although she's not English. See, I grew up with Top of the Pops and Jim will fix and so I was soaked in the culture of Jimmy Savile as a kid, and maybe that was part of my resistance to wanting to go, go back there, but I did, and... but. And that was combined with a, with a desire to understand better my brother's death, like how and why had he died, because he died at 47 of a heroin overdose. And that led me to look into an, a specific, a key influence in his life, which was the criminal Jimmy Boyle, who's a Glaswegian fix enforcer. 
uh, who did violent crimes and was arrested and who became both a partner, a business partner and a lover of my brother when he was uh, in his 20s. And my brother met Jimmy Boyle, this Glaswegian gangster, through our grandfather, Alec Horsley. Now, I found out as I started to look into this that my grandfather, Alec Horsley, was a Fabian, was actually a founding Fabian uh, in Hull, as in he was one of the founders of the Hull Fabian branch. So obviously, the Fabians, they go back to the 1880s, time that Karl Marx was in London, which, uh, and George Bernard Shaw and Virginia uh, Wolf and Sidney Webb and these various people, Havelock Ellis. Uh, and I didn't know anything about the Fabians, but I knew that they were in the so called, you know, the right wing conspiracy mindset or research that they came up a lot that was the only thing I knew really so I started to look into tabla rasa I had a pretty much a blank slate about the Fabian society and I didn't go to some of those sites that just kind of they didn't seem like they were very uh well cited and whatnot the conspiracy theories I just went to the facts I could find about on through the mainstream sources and uh anyway I found out more and more and more and more anyway I'm trying to wind this up because it's taking quite a while but it was a big deep rabbit hole and um tracking those two things well three things jimmy savile how he came to power and prevalence how he, he, he attained the position where he could commit such widespread abuses over 50 years the fabian society how they had shaped british politics from the late 19th century all the way to the present and even in the u.s there was a my um cross-pollinization, if you will, of Fabian politics with US politics. And then the third thing was my family history. And, so, and that was the thing that grounded me through the research. I was always bringing it back to things I had directly experienced and what was going on in my life because I grew up in that environment. I knew that my grandfather was a socialist, my father was a socialist. I didn't know about the Fabian part, but the more I looked into it, the more I did know. Uh, I mean, I recognize, oh, that, you know, the, and, and the names that I found that were involved, not just with Fabianism, but with the paedophile information exchange, which was related to the civil liberty, these movements in, in Britain around racial equality and um, legalizing homosexuality, liberalism, basically. Um, they, these names uh, also popped up in my father's, my grandfather's history, like he knew a number of these people. So all these things were coming together while I was writing the first part of Ice of Kings. And it was, it was a world changer. You see, I'd been a conspiracy researcher for 20 years and it had all been abstract. And I would always wondered you know, why, kind of, I'd wonder why am I so fascinated by these things? But as it got more and more grounded in my direct personal history and even things I remembered, but also things I didn't remember, but I could intuit, the more I understood why, because to keep it, really simple something had happened to me like i had grown up in that environment i'd been exposed to that predatorial energy i had been uh, caught i've been indoctrinated the way everybody had but more directly because i i grew up in a fabian aristocracy closet aristocracy of very rich influential businessmen who claimed to be socialist and so i was being groomed to be one of these, I won't say world leaders, they weren't that high level, although my uncle did, was Tony Blair's uh, rural czar. So, so they got pretty close to the top of that political pyramid. But anyway, whatever level, I, I was actually being groomed and I didn't really know it. And, and the grooming, as you know, I think from what you've said already pre-interview, did involve, I'm reluctant and obviously personally very sorry to have to say, but it, as far as I can tell, it did involve sexual abuse you know, I, I, like I like as far as i know it did happen to me but i don't have the memory of it um but it it the, all, all the indications are there and specifically the death of my brother seemed very clearly related he self-destroyed essentially uh, and so he he showed all of the symptoms of of this that i was uncovering um so anyway so that's that's probably a good summary not just the vice kings but my own uh, exploratory journey as, as a writer, like how it proceeded from the abstract to the the concrete and the experiential and the two worlds had to come together like that. For sure. But it seems to me that um, the pedophilia and the child abuse within the British ruling class, let's say the establishment, um, I remember when I was at Oxford and getting kind of wind of it from 
people that had gone through boarding school and that whole like a, a major aspect of the boarding school system right which is to separate the child from separate the child from the parents uh from a young age sometimes you know as, as you know as young as four or five years old right yeah. and basically put them into the school system that is grooming them and uh, not not just sexually obviously grooming them psychologically and psycho spiritually but oftentimes there is a homosexual aspect to it because at least in the old days i don't know now but it was oftentimes you know all men all boys right with each other uh separated from, from women and uh either you know sometimes it was done but between the kids and not and then often and then times there were obviously headmasters or others that would take advantage of the kids teachers and others who would take advantage of the children and then there was just an overall like it's like it's interesting how it's always kind of come to this question of like how how deep is this perpetuated within the british ruling society in a sense right this sort of you know as you know you keep a, a stiff upper lip so you don't talk about these things but it's always understood and known and there is this sort of underlying homosexuality that's 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 rampant um uh, within again within sort of the upper echelon and and then you get the characters like lord mountbatten who uh in, i believe is pretty common knowledge that he was involved with with pedophilia of a lot of in indian pakistani boys right uh, when he uh, when he was uh wasn't he viceroy of, of india i believe at one point or he was basically over there and he was basically uh trafficking young boys i mean that's pretty common knowledge now isn't it i don't know how common it is because uh, as you know with these things they can be recognized historically or officially but they don't necessarily uh people don't necessarily accept them or believe them or or want to think about them what what i know is and i've written mentioned in vice kings about lord mountbatten was that he was definitely connected to jimmy savile and it seemed as though he was the guy who introduced jimmy savile to the royal family so uh and then and, and jimmy savile's involvement as uh hasn't really been talked about very much despite everything that came out about him was that he wasn't just doing it himself to kids that he wasn't a, a, a procurer of children for high level politicians and royalty and so on and that was very much inseparable from his power and his influence as far as the schooling system goes um that is a I mean I didn't actually go I did go to boarding school briefly but it was mixed and then I went to an all boys school but I didn't board so I didn't actually get subjected to those kind of um initiation rituals if you want to call them that but what, what you're talking about there the grooming um but i do write about that and uh it does seem to me that yeah it's something that it predates british society because if you think of greek ancient greek with the the you know the pederasty of ancient greek the part of the initiation and the instruction of the boys by the elder greeks was did involve the sexual element whether it's homosexuality or not i mean who knows what homosexuality is we could say sodomy we could just talk about the facts um although uh, you know there are other there is there's a homosexual initiations if you want to call them that that don't involve sodomy but anyway sexual interaction between men and boys uh it it isn't always or maybe even in this context primarily driven by simply by sexual desire and gratification it seems to me it seems inseparable from what i write about more in prisoner infinity which i call trauma genesis which is the use of applied trauma through sexual abuse to configure the psyche or to distort the psyche in its formative stages in such a way that it will be pathologically driven to achieve because if, if we if we have a a, a, a formative wound, a deformative wound, that creates a core of shame and self-rejection. This is in the Ewan Cameron experiments, or not MK Ultra in Canada as well. Like he would, he would, while he was traumatizing his patients, he would have tapes repeating the loop in their ears, saying, "I'm worthless. I'm shit. I can't achieve anything. I just fail." Right, and so that would instill them with this, with this massive uh overwhelming drive to achieve because of the core shame and within them and that that seems consistent with this quite ancient tradition through aristocratic societies to traumatize their children to turn them into high achievers and so to me that's 
that's more of the deep context to homosexual initiation. It isn't necessarily specifically about homosexuality and certainly not about sex, but about the traumatization of children in their formative uh, stages. Right, and we've seen that certainly with a lot of the reports from the from the survivors of the MK Ultra or Monarch kind of programming, where they 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 basically found that they were being uh, almost, as you said, initiated into altered states, uh, sometimes greater heightened spiritual abilities or sensitivities, uh, right. remote abilities, things like this, right? Um, to yeah, as you say, from the perspective of the elite, to sort of engineer super super humans essentially right i mean that's kind of what they're what they're what the, the design has, has always been in yeah. the perspective right is engineering the superman it wasn't just hitler's concept it was uh, much much more ancient and deeper yeah and it's been popularized now uh with the with the marvel superheroes I mean, they've been around for a long time but i mean the, the movies have become the biggest kind of form of entertainment recently and it's in most many if not most if not all of those movies is that the process of transformation usually does involve some sort of trauma so yeah, it's a very that there's so, so many different angles and ways in which that can be perceived uh, that process and in the west and i've written this is more with rearing into prisoner infinity but i like to just keep free associating wherever the conversation goes that uh, in the West, we don't have the awareness that they have in the East, as far as I know, I've never actually been there, but things I've read, which is that psychism and spirituality are not the same. Like we tend, uh, in fact, they're, so, so a person who is psychic is, isn't more whole, they're in fact potentially less whole, and in the East it has to do with cities that on the path to development, you might start developing these cities, but these are traps. And I think, as far as I know, in the, in the East, they have to do with the entities come and they try and uh, hijack and sabotage a person's spiritual journey by offering these temptations like Jesus had in the desert. And, you know, Satan was saying to Jesus, you can turn uh, stones into bread or you can have power over all the king, like Satan was offers, offering Jesus power, superpowers. And, so, and in the East, they have that awareness that there are these temptations, and if you fall for them, you you fall further back than you were to begin with. So I am bringing it up now because what we think of or, or recognize as psychism in the West, we think of it as as a power, but actually it's a kind of it's certainly a kind of trap, but it's also symptomatic of being fragmented, of being traumatized. Because as, as you're referring to, there is a secret awareness. The log just fell out of the fire. I'll have to get it. There is this hidden awareness that there is a way to develop uh, superpower psychism through traumatization. And those subjects, as with MKUltra, can be turned into super soldiers or super spies or monarch slaves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but clearly they're not whole. I mean, this is not for that. That's just, this is not for the individual's benefit in any way. They might, they might think it is at some level, but essentially they're being weaponized. They're being turned, in, turned into instruments. I do just have to get that uh, log because it just fell right out of the fireplace. And it could burn down the house. So I'll be right back. Did it fall out? I got it. Okay, sorry about that. It's probably the subject matter. It's all good. Um, <laughs> indeed, we're activating things. So what you're suggesting, though, is the reason that, for example, um, trauma is being, is being can be utilized in uh, certain controlled conditions, right, to generate uh, what they might consider, you know, more elite, uh, you know, super, super men and women, right, the idea of activating the powers within uh, these children, but the, the trauma also operates as a control mechanism because it can create dissociation and, and all kinds of weakness and wounds that can still be hooked into by the by the controllers, which is why when they're doing these sort of mass traumas, which is the nature of a lot of cinema, I mean, there is a great divorce. There's a divide, as you know, historically in movies between the films of the the 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, even into the 60s, and then basically the, the cinema of the 70s, right, where it becomes much more uh, 
in your face, let's just say, as far as violence is concerned, you know, the, 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 the divide between the, the depiction of violence, you know, let's say like, you know, pre-19, I guess pre-Vietnam War, as opposed to post-Vietnam War, right? Where it's like violence is more subdued. It's, it's you know, there's no blood. It's, people know when they watch old movies, right? There's no blood. It's just like, it's an, it's an it, you know, something is being enacted. Whereas, you know, post-Vietnam, it's like the blood is in your face, the trauma is in your face, um, mm -hmm. the, the sex is in your face, right? The nudity is in your face. Everything is more explicit, right? So there's a divide in a sense. And you can almost suggest that uh, maybe people like Hitchcock kind of helped to transition that, right? Even though Hitchcock never was, never used nudity or explicit violence and blood, but he always did it in ways that were very subtle and, yeah. and, and right, and sort of, as, as he knew best, right? If you show, if you imply things, you show it just beyond the, the frame, people believe that they saw it, but you transition from that to actually, you know, basically the, the post Vietnam era when everything is very explicit when it comes to sex violence and uh, every, you know, and, and more, right? The discussion is, is more, you know, you move into, in, move into the R culture, the NC-17 uh, practically, you know, culture of that, of, of this time period post Vietnam. So you could say that the traumas are being now inflicted on the audience, the viewing audience, especially young people that are watching films. I mean, and we can, this can lead us into Kubrickon, obviously, because young people are watching films, you know, like A Clockwork Orange, right? Or uh, Bonnie and Clyde, uh, you know, the Peck and Paw movies. I mean, it's like, there's a, there's a big trend, there's just, there, the, the pen, the Arthur Penn movies, there's a, there's a shift here that's taking yeah. place in consciousness, right? And the trauma is being played out. And you could say it's simultaneous to Vietnam because as they, as they, as many on the right criticized at the time, you know, you can't show soldiers coming home in body bags. You can't show body parts. You know, if we'd done that during World War during World War II, we may, might have lost the appetite to fight, right? And they said, you know, during Vietnam, you, you, you started showing these things. Simultaneously, cinema started showing these things. And so I'm just suggesting that there was a, some, you know, essentially a conscious decision. And, you know, whether it was, I don't know if it was, you know, men in a room, but essentially consciousness made a decision to shift its perspective on reality into a much more brutal, traumatic experience, right, of life that was now portrayed on the cinema screen, on the TV, as opposed to pre, you know, pre-1968, essentially, right, pre-1967. 67, uh, Yeah, well, I'm just kind of smiling a lot because it's we're, we're really, whether by your conscious intent or not, we're really going, getting close to the work of your father because uh, with two reasons. One, he, he had this Vietnam trilogy, obviously, and for personal reasons, he was very interested in portraying the Vietnam War, um, but also the JFK thing because in in uh, Blood Poets, by which, for those who don't know, you, you obviously know if you saw it on the bookshelf or if you looked at it, it's, it's about violence in cinema. I mean, that was the first book I published, and that was my interest was in movies, but I realized at a certain point that if I wanted to write all about all the movies I loved, well, they were all violent, pretty much. So that was just the, the, the simplest uh, way to come up with a thesis that would I would get to write about all my favorite movies. So I came up with the cinema of savagery and uh, these two volumes about violence in movies. But I, I was interested in these deeper questions even then that you're bringing up. And so <clears throat> in order to make that plain from the start, I actually begin the book uh, officially after the intro, which does write about Hitchcock significantly and Psycho being a turning point, uh, also Peeping Tom, which was the same year. Uh, but I begin the book proper with, with the JFK assassination. And my, my hypothesis at the time was that the Zapruder film, although it wasn't shown until later, so I had to fudge it a little bit, but still this event happened in 63. Um, and uh, obviously that has, you know, has been done to death, really, that had this massive impact on the collective psyche of, of America, of the US. Um, and even before the Zabruder film was seen, but certainly after, I forget the exact date of the Zabruder film when it was aired, you may know, but I think it was as late as the 70s. I think it was, I'm trying know. to think if, if it was because uh, I know Time Life had it. They, and that, yeah, that's a good um, right. a variable because they did show the images. So yeah, I think that was how I was able to still argue. My argument was is that 
not only did it obviously it impacted everybody but it specifically impacted filmmakers because when they saw those images they realized and yes the vietnam war also of course but that they had to up their game you know that otherwise they just wouldn't be able to keep up with with reality and you know the serious 75 filmmaker. it says 75 i'm just briefly you know googling it yeah. it looks like no no not 75 sorry saying 60 75 but it also says 69 that Geraldo debut Geraldo Rivera de debuted the Zapruta film on ABC's Good Night America in uh, on February fourteenth, which is uh, Valentine's Day, right. <laughs> sixty nine. I mean, talk about sixty nine as a year. Yeah, of inversions, right? We've got the Manson murders. We've got the moon land. I mean, right? The moon landing is 69, the Manson sixty nine. Right? It's like it's really yeah. a strange. The year. Wild right. Yeah. So okay. So. Um, as I say, even if it was just the printed images, there was an awareness that this catastrophic event had happened, this most gory, horrific act in public, in broad daylight, in public view, which is, you know, JFK's head, and and the images were seen. I don't know if in the original time life, if they left, if they left out the image, actually, the image of the head exploding, but it seemed to me, I hypothesized that filmmakers such as Arthur Penn, who really, whose Bonnie and Clyde was the real breakthrough, in terms of cinematic violence, and then Sam Peckinpah consciously and intentionally tried to up, he tried to trump Bonnie and Clyde and succeeded with The Wild Bunch. Um, th th those filmmakers would have would have been consciously aware that this is we have to we have to represent this reality. We have to match it. We have to compete with it. And it was you know it was the end of Hitchcock really. Sixty three, The Birds. That was his last really effective movie. This does dovetail with Kubrick because sixty four was Doctor Strange Love, which I write about in the Blood Poets. And I have to justify well, okay, there's no violence in this movie, but it is about the destruction of humankind. So. Well, and the blending sequence is, is the most violent thing you can imagine, right? I mean, well, like, yes, but there's no blood in it. Right, <laughs> so it is the most violent thing you can you can actually do. Yeah. That's always that's always been the point, though. Just 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 by the way, is you know, what my father was making with natural born killers. The point he was saying was, look, we don't show that many people getting killed compared to like a movie like Bad Boys, which came out the same year, I think. Right, and he's like, they probably kill more people in Bad Boys, but for whatever reason, we're ultra violent because it's. I think it's cause the way that the film is done. It's it's more shocking to the psyche. It's more immediate. It's more perhaps. Even though it's overdone, it can feel more realistic, I guess, because of the nature of serial killers and their fear of these things. I mean, there's something more realistic to that than a big shootout with cops and drug dealers, right? Even though, again, these things happen, but they don't seem to, they don't seem as, as viscerally real for us as the fear of a serial killer, because we see that in the nightly news, you know, the warnings about that. So I don't know. There's, there is this well, interesting I, thing. I right? think, I think what, I mean, I was thinking about natural born killers just today, and it wasn't because I was going to be talking to you. It was because I was watching a documentary on on Charles Starkweather and and Caroline Fugue, and I was thinking about my my very long essay in the Blood Poets. It's one of the longest essays, and one of the things I say, I was well, I was thinking about why I liked that movie and whether I would like it if I watched it now, and. I don't know if I would or not, but I have the feeling and what I was thinking today was that even if I still liked it now, I would feel that there was something wrong with me for liking it. And But I also kind of feel, this is one of the points I made in the Blood Poets uh, about Natural Born Killers, because I, I refer to Pauline Kale a lot, because she was my mentor, not personally, but as a reader. And she she didn't review it because she's retired, but she she talked about it in an interview and she she really disliked it as you may or may not know she didn't really like your father's film um and she said that it was she implied it was very irresponsible because the kind of violence it was the kind of violence that gave you a heady thrill and it made you feel excited and kind of around turned on and my counterpoint was isn't that exactly how mickey and maori feel right and so what i felt that that film did much more effectively than clockwork orange which i really dislike as a movie and I, I think we could talk about that and the way it's, it, I think it's almost provably a kind of psyop of a movie. Um, but Natural Born Kills, although there were copycat murders there also, and I defended Oliver Stone in my book around that against John Grisham, but um, the, uh, the, the, the film, it, it, 
it really takes you inside the skin of what it's like to be a deranged killer and that's that is more disturbing that's more disturbing than to be a victim actually it's and certainly well, I don't know if it's, are, but it's, it's disturbing to have that experience right and that's so much of what natural point killers conveys right is the almost schizophrenia of of the experience right between dimensions of stock movie footage right and class you know b movie footage and corman you know corman-esque demons and dragons and then there's the anime right and it's like what is the mindscape of these people but what is the mindscape of any of us and i think what's so brilliant about it and also as you say it's such a hard film to watch because it's like this was the breaking point in a sense between uh the many dimension out multi-dimensionality of of our media landscape right this yeah. came this film comes out in 94 pre youtube and social media and all of a sudden you know we're in a landscape of 60 different you know how do you say we have so many different platforms we're interfacing with we're interfacing right here on a little computer you know and then you know you can have in the background you can have a movie going you could have you know you could have your social media feed you it, all these different channels in a sense right of existence of affecting our consciousness and i think that was why at the time it was really difficult to keep up with because the consciousness was it, that movie was it was so fast right they were saying it was hyper it was the editing was it was like hyperactive and now you look at it and you're like, well, it's slow compared to how quickly things are moving into our consciousness at any moment. So how old were you when you saw Natural Born Killers? And did your father, did he stop you seeing it when you were young or did he not mind? Oh, or? No, I mean, I was in the film, so I had a different perspective, you know, because I was 10 years old and nine years old in the film. And I saw it at 10, I guess that was the first time I saw it, it was no, actually about nine years old. I saw it the first time. So it was. Uh, I mean, at one level, I knew it was act. You know, it's like I know I saw the behind the scenes, so I wasn't as affected as as if I was just a normal nine year old kid. But at the same time, it was uh, it was a you know it was violent. It was violent, but I was also exposed to violence from a young age. As far as you know, watching you know I, the first movie I went to see in a theater was Beverly Hills Cop. <laughs> so I mean, it wasn't like I was you know I I was numbed in a sense to cinematic, not entirely to cinematic violence. I think. Again, there's been this shift in overall consciousness, and that's what I'm curious about: is the the viscerality of the violence of movies. You could say, really, during the Vietnam, from like you know, from the Vietnam era to the mid '90s, let's say, natural born killers kind of capping it, yeah. is different than the violence you see now. I mean, now you get the, the saw, the kind of the torture porn. You know, you get limbs, but it was like there was a viscerality to that violence that I don't think has really maybe i'm mistaken i don't it's not replicated in the same way uh maybe like tv shows will get it you know with with the you know game of thrones type of thing you know stabbing a mother a pregnant mother i mean those are those are like godfather-esque you know very high high operatic violence but it's not the viscerality of that those two decades and i'm just mm -hmm. curious what you discern as far as you're saying so it was the kennedy assassination in many ways that triggered that shift in consciousness but then what what sort of capped it was it the augment? I think it was the, to me, it was the advent of CGI. I think that kind of took us into a different realm of violence where we have more, you know, we have more distance between ourselves. And you talk about like Marvels and, you know, they kill half the population of the planet, but you don't, you don't feel as immediate with the violence as you do with maybe, you know, again, a natural born killers or a Peck and Paw film or a pen film. Well, cause there's a number of different things going on simultaneously here. I mean, countless really, but what we were, or I was touching on about around Vice of Kings, that's more to do with liberal progressivism as it relates to sexuality. And now we're at a stage in human society uh, where not only are all kinds of sexuality being tolerated, but they're being promoted. I mean, I don't want to get into the details, but I think bestiality is now legalized in a number of states. Uh, I don't even want to start this to where anal sex being taught to preschoolers, whatever the actual data points are. There's some pretty shocking facts out there to, to some of us who, who get called conservatives for being shocked. Um, so this is a this is a parallel thing, which is the 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 normalization of all forms of sexuality. I mean, the big one obviously is pedophilia and the, the, the movements of the 70s to normalize pedophilia. They didn't 
they, they might have appeared to fail in the 70s in Britain, they weren't so obvious in the US, but they didn't. They just, they, it was even consciously recognized, which I write about in Vice of Kings, is no, we need to tone it down. We can't just be brazen and up in the face and say we want to have sex with four year olds. You've got to make this academic, you've got to put it in papers, you've got to gradually, you've got Lolita, you've got, you've got these different, it's a slow, that's the Fabian method, is incremental, slow gradualism. Uh, so, so it just went, it toned itself down in the 70s, but we can see with woke culture now that <clears throat> really you can't really, and the, and the other thing of course is, is the is that de 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 determines the or like when a technology or something in society becomes prevalent, the morality has to change just to keep up with it. So of course the sexualize sexualization of children uh, is becoming, it's more and more you know, it's generational, so they're more and more sexualized. Now they have the technology to sexually engage, uh, you know, sending dick pics or whatever it is at whatever age, and, and to interact with, with pedophiles who pretend to be kids or don't, et cetera, et cetera. The point being is it's harder and harder to protect children from these things, and society isn't really geared to protect them. So it's going to become more and more necessary, in quotes, or justifiable to legalize or normalized pedophilia, just as with alcohol and marijuana and you know these other things that get legalized. Um, so that's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, with the violence, if you think about today, that the children, generations today, like the last generation, whatever, who, <clears throat> coming of age now, they have access not just to any kind of sexual stuff on the internet, but also actual snuff movies, which in, in my day and in Blood Poets, I had to, I had to make a, a case in my footnotes that snuff movies are real because there was this idea that they're a myth, which I could never quite understand because the idea that people who murder people don't have cameras, it just it didn't make any sense. But it was there was just this kind of mystification around it, like it couldn't be real because we, we would have the evidence. But anyway, now we, we lap from snuff movies are a myth to snuff movies are just there on the internet if you want to look for them. I never have but I know that they are, and you know, just, there are different kinds of snuff movie. Um, so I think, like I said, it's, it's a really huge subject, and we, you, were, you were bringing it back to, to film itself. Um, so I'll try to do that. But so, yeah, in the six, late 60s and the 70s, there was this rapid uh, explosion, really, of artistic, of creativity in the movie industry, and it's considered the golden age of cinema, and so far as I still love movies, most of them come from that period, and it, and it coincided with the, um, the, the freedom to, to, to depict violence and sexuality in the movies, like those two things happened simultaneously. So what was that? Well, um, you know, I, needless to say, I don't, like my last book before Kubrickon was 16 Maps of Hell, which is one that I think would interest you perhaps most of all, whether your father would want to read it, um, is about the Hollywood superculture and how Hollywood is an instrument of social control and of all these agendas between that, like the main instrument, essentially. Um, I forgot where I was going with that. Oh, the yeah, so I, I no longer have anything like Peter Biskin's view of the 70s, that it was simply this artistic renaissance. I have to put it in the larger context of sociocultural engineering, which is kind of MK Ultra on a collective level, as you inferred earlier, I think. How do you traumatize people collectively? How do you cause them to dissociate? How do you program them? How do you create altars so they can be controlled as a collective, as a society? I think it's quite tragic to consider that all of those great filmmakers were unwittingly serving an agenda and that it could only be effective. You think of something like Taxi Driver, great movie, and yet it was used to inspire John Hinckley to, to shoot Ronald Reagan, which I have no doubt was a covert operation and that it wasn't this, he watched Taxi Driver lots of times and got inspired, he was controlled, you know, Clockwork Orange style, and that Taxi Driver was probably used as an instrument to control him. Scorsese obviously thought he was just making his masterpiece, or hoping, but the people behind, the people behind Scorsese, Columbia Pictures and etc. well, they, they've got these artists that they've got on their hidden payroll, the artists don't know it, 
to create these artifacts that can be then used as weapons. And so there's two things happening simultaneously. Um, and uh, I don't remember if I had a last point there. I think I did, but I think I lost it. Um, yeah, I'll just I'll just hand it over to you at this point. Yeah. Well, so no. So it's in in terms of the um, the hidden the hidden subliminal messaging, right? It's always been a really curious thing to my mind. Is you point? I mean, for example, for example, as you point out in Kubrickon, there's you know the question of did, did Kubrick film the moon landing, and uh, I'm not I'm not 100 percent convinced that he's the one that did it. I think yeah. that I do yeah. believe it's done, but it doesn't really matter. It's interesting how uh, you, you talk about in your book about Widener's documentary and showing some of the the symbolism, the, the kid wearing the Apollo T-shirt. And there's also, you know, a monarch uh, poster in the background in one scene. Right. And it's like. These are things that in, at some level could have been placed. They also could be part of this consciousness thing, because I think, for example, in Natural Born Killers, there's a powerful cut in the film where Sizemore's character is talking about how he was traumatized as a child by his mother's assassination by one of the lone nuts, right? It's very much interesting. It goes to, uh, what was it, Whitman or the guy that shot from the tech, UT. Uh, yeah, yeah. Charles Whitman, yeah. Right? He was shot from the, the UT uh, tower. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like, it was like Whitman was playing out what people think Oswald did, right? Like this lone Marine former Marine goes up there and starts shooting. Right. And so he ends up killing people. And so in the story of natural born killers, they take that event as an experience of direct trauma for Sizemore's character who sees his mother get her brains blown out. And in that moment of the film, they cut from him expressing that to a monarch butterfly. <laughs> and you're sitting there going, is this conscious? Is well, this you, conscious? you have, uh, do you have that? to the source there sorry but you have access there to the source you could ask your dad right which i don't know if he would if he would but see, I don't, have, have you asked him? but that's the question to me is i i look at all this as much more layered it's almost there is like this experience of consciousness that we have intuition and i think oftentimes you know again this this delves into the question of the non-material realm right of beings that are beyond our perception that are also influencing our decisions sometimes absolutely right? Absolutely, which is, where I, which is where I like to go. I mean, where I, want, I, I do want to go with my work and hopefully with this conversation. It's just, it's a tricky transition um, because because it can also be a get out. It can also be a... Uh, I'm not trying to avoid, but it's like just recognizing that not it's it, we can't always ascribe agency to people, you know, in the sense of there is agency, there is agency, but at the same time, we can't assume agency if we can't prove it, right? So, you know, Absolutely. saying, you know, say, for example, like with the with the way the taxi driver uh, perhaps may have helped, what was it, was it uh, the, the Lenin's assassin or who was it that, that was- No, it was Reagan's oh, attempted sorry. assassin. Sorry, Reagan's assassin, exactly. And Reagan's assassin, of course, was who? It was, uh, he was the family- Hinkley. Of Hinkley. Who was friends with the Bush family. Uh, yeah. His father was very close to, to Bush, I think it was his father was close to Bush senior. I mean, they were basically very close to the Bush family, the Hinckley's. So, you know, without the evidence, you sit there and you go, well, you know, was this a Bush plot? Was this a CIA plot to basically put pressure on the Bushes and say, listen, you know, the Bushes didn't necessarily sign off, but hey, if anything goes wrong, we'll, we'll, we'll dump this in your lap, you know, right? I mean, so you don't always know all you can, it's a strange, it's a strange reality. All you can say is like, these are the facts that we know. This is yeah. what happened. This is my, you know, kind of what I think, but you, you, it, it's so difficult to assign agency when you don't a hundred percent know who did it and, you know, and for what reason. <laughs> well, yes. Okay. So, but I mean, agency itself is, it's almost a philosophical question. And this is a conundrum that I, I do explore in 16 maps of hell and perhaps other works too, that there's a sort of fundamental paradox in the conspiratorial view of history, because it has to do with how secret manipulate as a stripping us of our agency uh, and so, so thereby so it attributes agency to agents 
whose function is to strip us of agency, but does, are there then two species, right? Uh, or are there, are there, is there a hidden class that's so, right? There's some sort of fundamental contradiction in there, which I think can only be resolved by allowing for some non-human element, as you just hinted at. Um, but as I replied, it's very risky to go there. One has to really build one's way to it, I think, with with data and with logic and arguments and so on and evidence. Otherwise you go straight to David Icke and, and I don't like to go straight to David Icke. I don't want to end up making a hypothesis like David Icke does. Um, so, but, so my approach is, is, to, uh, is not to theorize. Like, so, so with the Hinckley thing, uh, I don't, yeah, I don't try and come up with a theory for who did it. I just, I have when I've written about that particular thing, I just lay down all the, the data points and it's just so obvious that there was a conspiracy that's all I need to know, essentially. I might, I say I don't theorize, but I mean, I don't theorize about the agency in terms of who did it and so on. I, but I might theorize as I just did with taxi driver. Look, there's evidence that this wasn't an alone nut, but apparently he truly was influenced by taxi drivers. So then I introduced this theory I just did now that, that does connect those two things. Well, why not? Why wouldn't the CIA who are involved in MK Ultra use actual created works rather than have to cobble together their own things for brainwashing using amateurs you know the cia they don't have scorsese or spielberg or maybe spielberg actually is working for the cia but you know what i mean there's there's levels and certainly there are real genuine artists in hollywood making real work or the once were in the 70s but but what's the deeper background what's the context for that to bring it back to this original question the violence that erupted i think it was part uh you know ground up or whatever the word is you know grassroots kind of thing of artists who are genuinely finding their voice in the Paris express but i think there was a higher level which is a much more widespread thing i know that was the last point i was going to get to was this fairly well-known one now about the Weimar Republic leading to Nazi Germany, that if there are periods of intense liberalization or freedom, there is always a corresponding crackdown. And that it's, it's in there as well as outer. Like people who are liberated too quickly or exposed to too much sex and violence, etc., too quickly, they actually want to close down. They, they, they are ready to, to have the forces of law come in and say, okay, enough of that. So, so that's a very widespread social engineering. And uh, that I would say, if that wasn't ongoing, then Scorsese, uh, De Palma, Coppola, these artists that we really respect, your father, they, they wouldn't have been given the freedom to do what they did. That, that's my theory based on the evidence. So. Right, right. No, I mean, it's look, it's, it's one of these questions that uh, I don't think even sometimes they fully know, right? I mean, there's like, there's an understanding of power structures, and sometimes you glimpse it. But, or some people are more in, involved with it, more entangled with it than others. But uh, it, it is, it's, it's, it's this grand mystery. And I think, you know, so I want to get to Kubrick, because you're, you're hypercritical of him. <laughs> and and uh, I think you know Kubrick's fascinating because I, you know, my person. I, I think I pr I appreciate the the work. I I think uh, two thousand one. I do I do love the themes of two thousand one. I think he's very much predicting what has come in a sense in this decade with the shift with the shift to transhumanism. With, and I don't know that he necessarily had the script it, but he certainly understood you know where we were going. Um, and, uh, you know, eyes wide shut the sec the sexualization of the culture in a sense is, you know, you talk about t television now and films, I mean, television now with Netflix and stuff is it's, it's probably more explicit than what we used to call Skinamax in the nineties. Right. I mean, it was like the, the access to sexual material, as we know, is also a gateway to pornography, you know, showing, showing people, you know, a lot of explicit erotics, uh, arousing material. It, it is the gateway to you know to more uh, uh how do you say it's more explicit paths including the sexualization of children um so all, all this has been done the last two decades in particular i would say you know obviously it's it was gradual it was a gradual process of bringing you know pornography closer and closer but now it's really at the level of as you talked about you know basically young girls being sexualized being told you know 13 not just told by the culture essentially you know how to dress 
uh, to portray themselves sexually, to you know, offer themselves sexually. All that is going on and has been a gradual uh, process. But I think and Lolita obviously is partly about that. So I think Kubrick in many ways predicted all that was coming. I want to understand how you think that perhaps he was um, essentially working for the superstructure uh, in terms of the, the, the choices of, this, of the films that he, that he put out. Yeah, the superculture. Um, yeah, well, it's, that's a very general question. It's very why, like, uh, I'm wondering where to begin with that. Because um, it wasn't, like, my initial view of Kubrick back in the blood purse was simply, I don't get it. Why is he so great? Somebody explain it. And But there was also some you know, hostility, I have here, and like, I, I was a critic, so... I, I wanted to take him to task. He's really not as good as people say, which is what Pauline Kael's point about Kubrick was. Um, so that so that was how it all began. You know, my 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 view of Kubrick. Um, and Clockwork Orange was the movie that I most wanted to see as a teenager, as a film buff and a teenager, because it was it it wasn't it was banned. I mean, Kubrick had withdrawn it in Britain because of the copycat killings and the threats that he received and so maybe that would be a place to start with clockwork orange as a as a you know devil is in the details as, as a case study in itself that the book clockwork orange written by anthony burgess as i describe it in the in the kubrickon was you i mean anthony burgess was working for mi6 mi5 or six when he wrote that book i mean this is his official biographer who writes about this um and he was recruited by them or, or, or assigned by them to to write the book, or at least if he'd already chosen to write it, that to include in the book things that they wanted to be included. So, however, you know, to whatever degree, Clockwork Orange was written by Anthony Burgess as a vehicle of um, I'm not sure what the adjective or the word would be because I'm not entirely sure how it was used, but as a vehicle for MI6 for espionage for intelligence work. Uh, and then Kubrick comes along and he makes the movie. Now the movie is um, is about brainwashing. It's about mind control, which I I point out in the Kubrickon. You could say about many of his later movies, if not all of them, to one degree or another. Uh, if you include artific artificial intelligence in terms of you know trying to understand how to program consciousness, then even 2001 seems to be about that subject also. So this was a prevailing interest to Kubrick. And, you know, my overall thesis is, is that Kubrick was interested in, in uh, how artificial intelligence could actually be created and that he had a very different angle of approach to what most people think of as how artificial intelligence is going to come about. And that he would, and I have the documentation in the Kubrickon that he was approached by the US intelligence community i forget the exact uh, agency but it's there in the documentation as a to to be recruited for some form of work in propaganda intelligence work uh but that's all we have is this this documentation uh, and a number of other filmmakers also uh, anyway around the same time uh, post dr strange love and so so my quite tentative thesis which I build upon as I proceed is is that 2001 was the beginning of this secret project which was about how to how to create artificial intelligence and as you say he anticipated many things and I think one of the things he didn't even have to anticipate was was the internet because it was being developed at that time through DARPA with DARPA. So I, what I think he predicted was that the internet would be the primary means for creating artificial intelligence through the gathering of data via human interaction. And so that he, he set about to create a film oeuvre that would be like a sounding board or a connecting circuitry between the audio, the, the collective who would be interfacing with the technology and the technology, just one of many, but to create an audience cult around him and his movies that would that would attract and capture an obsessive kind of attention, which is exactly the kind of energy, attention, data that is needed to uh, to make to animate the machine. So that that's kind of my thesis, which I'm aware is almost almost or maybe very much like a science fiction 
thesis that belongs in the movie. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not naive about that and where, and where it sounds incredible, but uh, I, there were just certain things that just seemed to point to that. So I thought, well, let's try and see if I can fill in this thesis and make it believable, almost as a, not a stunt exactly, but the nodding. So I think you kind of know what I mean. It was, it was a creative experiment. And uh, and I just surprised. I was more and more surprised. I just kept finding more and more evidence, and uh, for, that this is how his movies function. And part of the evidence, of course, is the cult of Kubrick. The audience on the internet, YouTube now, that are doing all this obsessive stuff with his movies. Um, another part of the evidence is the movies themselves, uh, and another a third part of the evidence is one I'm more familiar with in my other books. I'm more. Um, you know, trained out, I've trained myself, is looking at Kubrick and his connections and his life, you know, the minutiae of it, to see how, uh, how affiliated he was or was not with agencies and individuals and agendas, how much his career was assisted and facilitated from day one, how much his reputation was just constantly being bigged up. I mean, look at your father as a counterpoint, constantly being trashed and, you know, there's just, there's no... Uh, like Kubrick actually prevented a book being published about him that was um, that was balanced. Right? He 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 wouldn't he would, couldn't have a balanced criticism of his work. Right. It be, right. So what's that about? How did he do that? Why did he do it? Kubrick had an unprecedented amount of power in the film industry. So to me, that's that itself is a that raises a question. He didn't. He's not Spielberg. He didn't make millions with any of his movies. Really, two thousand one was a big hit, but. But still, it wasn't that big. It wasn't Jaws. And, and Spielberg didn't have carte blanche after Jaws either. But somehow Kubrick had this incredible amount of freedom. Jay Widener's thesis is, has to do with he, did, he filmed the moon landing. He did this favor of the government. And then he had freedom thereafter. Something bad happened. In those. To me, that's, that's, too, that's too much like fiction to me. It's kind of too obvious. The, the, the way that social culture and anything works, it's not obvious. You can't just make a tidy theory about it. Uh, it's really hard to get your head around. That's what I found in Vice of Kings. Most 99% of conspiracy theory is is basically off, off. It's just wrong because because most people can't think the way social engineers think. They just can't. I don't know if you've read Carol Quigley. I felt like what the, you mentioned the title of your work that reminded me. I haven't actually read him, but there are works by insiders. Um, but they're very hard to get your head around because these people, they think in terms of hundreds of years, they just think in a completely different way to us. And and I I have some inside awareness because I grew up in that environment. So I did develop a certain ability to, to think the way that our invisible controllers think. I get a bit of a headache when I say that because I think the real invisible controllers are literally invisible. I think they're not even human but the, there is a human element that where they're just kind of whoa what and like Bertrand Russell I mean he's one of the guys identifying Vice of Kings he's considered a cultural genius he's kind of off limits like Gandhi or someone like because he's he, but that's he, the level of intelligence he, right? he promoted uh, the, the viruses and disease to wipe out billions of people essentially and you know he uh, he talked about preemptively nuking Russia. I mean, <laughs> he was, you know, they say he's this great pacifist, right? I mean, he was pretty, you know, sick. He was very, well, you know, it's a sort of typical British lord. <laughs> so I would put well, it. Yeah, I would agree, absolutely. But his reputation is pretty intact, isn't it? I mean, it's, and, and he is, it is hard. It's like they said about the Batman in The Dark Knight Returns, like it's too big. Like when somebody is saying that we have to do this, this, and this in order to bring about this end, and you and you can actually think, well, maybe he's right. Maybe the end does justify the means because, you know, because he's they're pretending to think on such a large scale. But I mean, I don't, I don't go there because I think they're just they're, they're vampiric psychopaths essentially. But they are, they are operating at a level that most of us can't understand. So, so I try not to be moralistic about it without losing my moral compass. Uh, but bring it back to Kubrick, uh, I do think he was some kind of genius. And I do think his movies are unlike other movies and that he's doing. So I, I, but I just don't think that they're what we think they are. And I think, uh, bring it to Clockwork Orange, that it wasn't a coincidence that that movie actually inspired violence. And it wasn't, um, 
it wasn't i don't think it was simply that kubrick was worried about getting retaliation that he withdrew it i i would i could speculate that he had a conscience that giving him some credit a benefit of the doubt but but at least that he he was aware that that movie was an experiment in and of itself to see if a movie could do the things to the audience that the movie itself was showing being done to its character it's very symmetrical and it was effective and so mm. he was worried you know he had some genuine worries about that mm -hmm. i don't know it's, it's interesting it's an interesting uh, supposition um so basically uh, it's it's social engineering right i mean that's that's partly what what's what cinema does you'll talk about predictive programming and there is that there are aspects of of that but um a lot you know it's overall social engineering it's when you want to create connect you you want to create lifestyles in a sense right that's what this is done and i think cinema for me it's funny you know 99 is when kubrick died it's like as i mentioned earlier to me a lot of cinema basically died right around 2000 when we transitioned to the 21st century because we did move from film into digital right we moved into uh, a space where most storytelling basically is centered around cgi and not most i should say but a lot of storytelling became centered around cgi and it seemed to have, we have lost uh, a lot of the classic storytelling abilities because maybe there was this disconnect with dialogue and all of a sudden we I, I i looked at it like well they're basically they're they're making movies to the lowest common denominator it wasn't like we're trying to actually elevate the audience or make people think or, or you know how do you say just make clever dialogue anymore it's like we're basically trying to uh cater to five-year-old consciousness right and that was this big shift that took place it felt like after 2000 and so i'm just curious you know obviously you've seen that now the growth of television the growth of streaming people don't go to movies anymore the experience the communal experience the religious experience that was cinema for basically you know most of the 20th century is pretty much shrunken to a different experience more personal more isolated right yeah do, do you see the social controllers being as interested in movies anymore or is it really more about the social media landscape right uh yeah. controlling the dialogue there as much as possible controlling the paradigm there because yeah. in many ways we're more fragmented and actually i think that's also a positive there's like there's both positive and negative right you can have more individuality and perhaps more personal in choice at the same time maybe you don't have as much impact or influence as in the old days when you know a filmmaker could put people into a, a box and tell a story you know for two hours to millions of people um i think i mean i think there is some positive like you and i are connecting we wouldn't have been able to connect and so some things do happen for sure but i think they're really vanishingly small and they're getting smaller because most people are just locked into social media uh, distractions and even the area that we work in a large part of it is what I call conspiratainment. It's a kind of controlled opposition where even, you know, there are free agents in it that don't realize they've been recruited by the King's controlled opposition because it's clickbait. It's keeping people distracted and it's keeping people on their devices, which is the main, that's the end game, I would say. And you think about uh, what you're saying about cinema movies in cinemas, at the very least, even if they're corporate, you know, uh, military, industrial entertainment, product propaganda um it's communal people are coming together and sitting in a cinema and they're having a communal experience and that is 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 central to what's being destroyed that's being taken away is you know and any form of real communal connectivity between human beings so that we can only interconnect we will only interconnect through the media through the technology which is completely controlled completely like we're only able to have this conversation because they it's allowed right it's, the internet is still relatively free but at any time even you know even tomorrow it could that quickly these freedoms could be taken away because you know the powers that be have control over the the infrastructure of that um hopefully i didn't freeze up because it looks like you might have frozen up yeah we're still coming through <laughs> listen yeah um so uh this yeah i mean this this stuff tells with the kubrickon very much because uh 
yeah movies movies have given over to or to tv on the one hand which is really unexpected like most of the quality stuff i think even that's gone now to be honest i think there was a period of the tv renaissance but i don't i don't think that's over now but anyway there was this period of transition and what was that about well why have much better tv well two things one is it's solitary people do it at home uh, and two it, it's long form so it's binge this whole binge watching thing you get people to stay at home for longer and longer periods and soak up the propaganda even if you love it game of thrones whatever it's still got this other covert function um so people are either staying at home more which obviously the era of covid was really about making that happen and and uh they're, they're glued to their tech right uh, so uh, that's that that's tv but then i think the um the what's much more prevalent and much more indicative of, of a shift is the social media platforms including youtube or what have you where people do create their own content i mean everywhere you create your own content on social media but i mean youtube you you, you can be an artist and do it um uh the so so the, yeah the i don't want to say the end game because it's an easy term but certainly really central to my thesis about the kubrick on as in kubrick's attempt to to use his films to create a body of work that would be, uh, be able to interface with the internet in order to gather data for the creation or the inception of artificial intelligence. That thesis, that social media, this age of post-cinema social media is all about audience interaction. That's the key. And, and, and this has to do with complicity because it's, it's one thing to control people to get them to, to not disobey to not rise up, to not prevent the control. It's quite another to be able to recruit them, to get them to basically, they're your ground army. They're on the ground and they're creating the content and they're, they're spreading the memes and they're spreading the sexualization and the violence, whatever it is that's part of the social engineering, they're doing it to themselves. So not only have you got this army that's creating more and more of the content and feeding more and more energy into the machine, but you've got their complicity. You've actually you've got them by the, the balls then because they're they're invested. They actually believe it's their own uprising and it's yeah. actually part of the conquest of the human soul. Yeah. Well that's I mean, certainly we've seen that with how many influencers bought into the whole pandemic and were basically taking checks as Jimmy Levy exposed, you know, we're getting paid to promote all the the talking points during the lockdowns, right? Uh, shots, everything basically they were getting paid to do. And how people obviously went along with that narrative without batting an eye, you know, unlike, you know, few like the Joe Rogans who's, who just did what they wanted. Most just obviously complied. And so I think it's very interesting what you're saying is essentially, yeah, it's like opt, basically they're getting people to opt into their own self-destruction. Um, and uh, it doesn't sound like, it sounds like you're pretty pessimistic for, uh, for the, the future. Uh, socially speaking, societally speaking, I'm 100% pessimistic, but... But you have to not remember because I haven't said it before, but I have to add that um, I've never been, I've never had a positive view of society. I've always seen it really. And there's a brief period where I was trying to make it in Hollywood, which has been the time I got blood poets to your father. Uh, the, um, and even then, actually, even then I was like, why am I doing this? Why am I trying to get, you know, get connections in Hollywood when I think society is all just a basic trap? The soul trap and it's all going to hell but but anyway uh my my view is is that the i don't want to oversimplify it but yeah i'm very pessimistic for anyone who feels and this is the majority who feels that they can find themselves a place not just in hollywood but in society because i don't think there is a place for human beings in society not anymore i mean i don't really think there was a good place ever but since the covid and since the, the enforcement of a very dangerous experimental nanotechnological implant into the body that people are submitting to because they're afraid to lose their jobs or not see their grand i mean just the, the organized evil that we We've seen over the last couple of years uh, has just made it really the writings on the wall that there is no safe place in society 
I'm not saying you're safe if you go back to nature and try and live off the land like I'm trying, because of course there's drones and, and the nanotech is everywhere. But at least, at least I'm, at least one can move in the right direction, which is away from complicity to and complete uh, submission to something that is more and more observably evil. But that, to me, is a, that is a kind of optimism because. Uh, human beings have been able to live with the land and in small communities for thousands of years. I'm not saying it was easy. I'm not saying it was ever good, but it was certainly a lot better than it it, it is now and and it's going to be. Uh, and so whatever it takes, really, to um, inspire or encourage the, those of us who have enough discernment to recognize evil when they see it, to make that very difficult transition, that seems like a positive outcome. As long as there's enough, as long as there's a few people who do that, I'm not. I, mean, I don't want to sound like I'm, I don't care, or, but but people do. They do have to lie in the bed that they make, and if people won't actually look at the writing on the wall, if they won't look at the evidence and the data around. For example, COVID and the mRNA. What can what can a person do? One can end up just being called a crazy conspiracy theorist and and not having one's emails answered anymore. There's a certain point where one simply has to accept that uh, there is enough uh, evidence now to know what the the right trajectory is and to just start making it and just letting others know that one is doing so and encourage yeah. and yeah. well i think i think what you said is it, the very valid just you know the idea of trying to fit in society is already uh pathological in some ways it's like there's there's a problem when you're trying to conform to something that's inherently sick as we've seen with you know with these different models of our societies for, you know, for going on thousands of years right um even the natives, you read the anthropological, you know, discussions between the the natives of America, the Americas, and the European settlers. You know, and the Europeans are like, you know, the natives are going, why are you bowing down to some royal? Why are you, you know, you're, you're you know, you're you're dressing, you're you're putting on this whole apparatus of wigs and all this costuming just to, you know to fit into your society, right? And it's always been this way. It's like trying to fit into something that may not even be innate to your your true nature, and. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's that's the point. I think that we are at this breaking point, right? Where society is going to become, it's technocratic. It's going to be increasingly transhuman, and as a result, unhuman, inhuman, inhumane, and however you want to describe it. And uh, and then there's going to be those that are just say, you know what? I don't want to fit into that. I want to connect, you know, in a more holistic manner. And I think that we're going to have a lot of people that uh, that feel the same way, and we'll create new society, new societies or communities or cultures, right? That are um, counter to this uh, mainstream narrative well they still exist here in spain to some degree and i'm not saying that these people are anything like enlightened or particularly unusual but just that the infrastructure still exists here and presumably in many other countries uh as in just very tiny villages where people grow their own food and they they don't do much else <laughs> right and it's uh it, well i don't know i mean i think it's just it, it just takes a lot, not for these people, because they're, well, they're all old now. The young generations have all moved to the cities and whatnot. But so for most people, and certainly the younger generations, the, the, the difficult thing is, is to be willing to unplug, you know, to, to actually um, let go of all of these distractions. And because when you let go of the distractions, just like an alcoholic who gives up drinking, you have no choice but to face this terrible emptiness or this terrible uh, pain that is inside that you've been using all these things to distract yourself from and, and actually increasing whatever is problematic inside, you know, by all the, the bad habits that we've developed and the addictions. And so that that's very much, I would say, that that's the the massive hurdle that that we all have to face. I mean, anyone who is willing to, to to make that change of trajectory is going to have to to face and to confront uh, before we even get to the difficult the uh, the traditional difficulty of being a human being who lives off the land because right? that's hard too. <laughs> but most people won't won't be able to get to that point because it'd just be so so painful. 
uh, to let go of all of these these little toys that we've been given. Well, and that opens up another conversation, which I'm really curious to read your upcoming book, um, right? About uh, the Big Mother. What is it? Yeah, Big Mother: The Technology of Evil. Yeah, I'm curious to read that, and maybe we'll have another conversation to follow. Uh, but. I've kept you long enough. This has been a long conversation. I feel like we've just barely scratched the surface because there's just so much to get into. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad that we finally connected because it seemed like we never were going to be, but it seems like we have uh, some similar perspectives on this. So it's always good to meet a potential ally. Yeah. Especially going into this, this new, uh, this new time frame, this new, new reality. Well, yeah. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there's not, uh, my point is there aren't many, uh, all, I won't say all this because we've just met, but I don't find many souls who are really willing, ready and able to, to, to face the facts. It's one thing to talk about them and discuss them, but it's quite another to really face them full on. Um, so yeah, and that's just as a last point uh, to you, but to anyone who listens, my, my real uh, interest and the reason I write books and do interviews so I can sell books is is to is to connect to individuals and to work with them unfortunately online still but in group I do group work online and do one-to-ones and just really to to deepen it deepen it and get it to much more to the practical and the personal mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. well actually how we live our lives that's that's where the change needs to happen beautiful well thank you excellent um